Let me, uh, let me, let me just reflect off a little bit of uh, Brother Shuhart here because, and I do appreciate his passion. Uh, today, I got the phone call that another lady I know in the church, her son was found dead from an apparent uh, suicide. It's the second one in 10 days. Since November, thir- uh, November of last year, over 12 prominent pastors have committed suicide in America. One who was uh, uh, over many, when I say many, four or 500 churches with a gunshot wound uh, in his late 40s. So we, we're living in a time where, and I was talking to my mom about it because it's, not, it's something that has not escaped many of you. You've, you've dealt with suicide and you've seen it. But what we can't seem to get through to people is, and my mom mentioned this, is collateral damage. What I mean by collateral damage is all the people that you don't even realize are getting hurt by you doing something to yourself and harming yourself. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't have the answer for it. I can tell you I sense a spirit of uh, depression and, and, and suicide destruction that, that just permeates, particularly in this area. And it's not so much out of poverty. A lot of it's out of foolishness. It's uh, accidental overdosing. It's trying to reach a high that you got once that you'll never find again, and you keep chasing the high, and uh, you're not going to get it again. You're not going to get it again from liquor. You're not going to get it again from sex. You're not going to get it again from, um, from drugs. You know, it, it, it's meant to entice, to grab, to hold, and then once that, to drag you down and under. So I say that very soberly to let you know that we do have an enemy that we're fighting, and we're here to create an atmosphere in which God rules and reigns, and when we create the right atmosphere, then we have a climate. When you got the right climate, we become the strong man. Jesus becomes the strong man of the house, and after that, we have a new culture here. Amen? Amen. And that, that's what we're after. And, and I, you know, preventive, if, if I ever went into the pharmaceuticals, I'd go into preventive. I would give you a pill that said, I think this is going to help you. And then if it don't help you, it don't matter. Is that right? That's what I'm finding out more and more. The more I deal with things, you know, it's like, well, we think this is going to help you. Well, what if it don't? I get my money back? No, it's, it's preventive. But I don't think many times we understand how many times we've prevented people that are in our midst and around us because of the words we say, the testimonies we've used, the fellowship we've had with one another, how we've prevented pain and hurt in their life. And so I think it's important to remind yourself that you matter. You being here matter. What you do for other people matters. How you treat other people matter. Uh, you know, I, I, as a matter of fact, what we need in this nation is, is the go to the title of this message, if you would, is defining moments. We need some moments in this nation, and we've had them, and I will mention them to you, but we've had moments where things changed. There was a moment, and, and uh, you know, we, when we see this thing, the problem is that we'll start getting calloused to pictures of beheadings and things of that nature. And that's going to be the problem we're going to go through in, in this nation. And then the next problem will be up quickly. We are so media savvy now. Everything is moves quickly. It's hard to watch, you know, a, a two-hour show. You want to watch an hour show, a 30-minute sitcom now, YouTube clip. You know, everything is real fast, you know. So we, we, we want what we want real fast and quick. But I, I'm praying we'll start having some defining moments. Last week I mentioned to you, and the thought here is responding to spiritual influence. How will we have defining moments in this nation? By responding to spiritual influence. To respond. When you sense God do something, to respond to him. To, to make sure it could be in your business, at your school, wherever you're at, to, but respond. When God talks to you, that small voice, and I told you last week, you move quick. You don't wait. You move quick. You don't try to rationalize it. You don't try to figure it out like a child would. You just go after it. You heard a voice, you move to it. God has called us, and this I'm going to review a little bit from last week, to be proactive for the activity, to make the activity start, to get some start. Jesus was always involved. He, he's not a, you know, whenever I see Buddha, and please don't take offense to this, but, but I, I just see a, a pudgy, fat a Chinese man sitting on a pole or whatever he's sitting on, and somebody comes by and rubs his belly and throws nickels at his feet, and, and he has no activity. There's nothing about him, it moves. The only time you've ever seen Jesus still in your pictures in your mind is him praying at Gethsemane on the cross at Calvary. Other times he's moving, man. 
He was always active while he was on this earth. We see him very involved in people's lives and going into people's lives. And he, and he taught us to be that way, to be full of those uh, opportunities to go and reach out to other people and not just sit back and let somebody rub our belly and throw nickels at our feet. So the problems we talk about in America, we do have speed without direction. We have no purpose. We have thrills without happiness. Everybody's want, want a thrill, but there's no real joy in their life. Uh, houses without homes. We, you know, it's, 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 it's even beyond the divorce rate. It's the fatherless homes. It's the homes without dads, without, uh, without the, the, the cohesion and connection. And, and, and again, thank God for mama. But we have religion without Christ. We're getting in a place now where, where we, and you, you mentioned it, a lot of the churches now, and I'm not here to put any of them down, but they are about feel good. They're about telling you about feeling good. Uh, it's amazing. The average sermon now on Sunday morning is 15 minutes. You know how crazy? I can't even get my intro out in 15 minutes. <laughs> huh? You know, it, but it's 15 minutes. It, and, and, it, and it's kind of like, Mur. you know, you kind of herd them in and Mur. herd them out, get the next 15 minutes in. And I'm thinking, I wouldn't drive, uh, you know, an hour for a 15-minute sermonette for Christianettes. I want to hear the Word of God. I want it to change my life. Amen. I want to be able to, to, to sense Him. I want to worship at least 15 minutes. I want to be involved and in, I want to fellowship for at least 15 minutes. Don't just give me a 15-minute sermon. That would mess me up. So what we do, we're seeing a lot of this changing going on, religion without Christ. Uh, it's just about doing religious things, doing, being good. we got all kind of good boy clubs around. we got lodges everywhere, people doing this, doing that, and they're trying to build their own self-esteem up. Somehow, let me tell you, that's not grace, and that's not going to get you to heaven. Right. Amen. Glad you're doing good, but that's not going to work. So we've got to change the spiritual climate. How do we do that? We respond to spiritual influence. It creates atmosphere. Now, you've got to put yourself in a position in order to respond to a spiritual atmosphere or a spiritual influence. You've got to put yourself there. God ain't always going to walk up in your house and snatch your, uh, your remote control from you and say, Hey, listen to me. You've got to be moving into a place where God is able to talk to you. Man, we'll work on that in just a little bit more. Atmosphere sustained creates climate, so we'll get our climate changes. Climate maintained creates strongholds. Stronghold sustained creates a culture. We talked last week how this ISIS and Hamas thing, it is a culture they're trying to build. They're putting in a, a climate of fear into people's lives. That's why the video and the beheading, things of that nature, they're trying to put that climate. They're trying to build a climate of fear. My question is this, seriously, then what? Okay, say you destroy America, then what? Say you destroy Israel, then what? Then you'll destroy yourselves because you're heathenistic, you're atheistic. Uh, uh, some are. Uh, some, some have a God, but, but he ain't worth uh, serving or loving. He, he's dead. Hello? Then what? See, people don't think about the then what. Uh, when, when you go through a, a whole village and you massacre the, uh, the men and, and, and uh, uh, you abuse the women and the children, and then you come back and say, one day we'll be a nation and y'all going to be our people, then people ain't going to love you. They're going to figure out a way to take you out too. Amen. So you have started a, a not just a, you, you, you absolutely put a, clim, a, a climate of fear in the area. You've created that, but now you're going to have to live with the culture that it's going to bring forth. And it's only going to bring forth violence. It will constantly keep bringing forth violence. That's why this thing can't be defeated with a bullet. Sure, we could hopefully hunt down 1,500 and kill them all. That's fine. But the bottom line is it's ideology. It's ideology. I'm not against shooting them, okay? But I'm telling you, it's ideology. It's the way they think. Changed in the way we think. It's very important. That's what changed you. Changed the way you thought. So every voice conveys a message. The voice is a vehicle of your spirit. When you say something, there's more than just words coming forth. Your spirit's attached to it. And again, it ain't what you say. It's how you say it. Uh, uh, I just had somebody behind me coming over here. And when I passed a vehicle, they heard my car. And then they knew it was me. They didn't know it was me. They just saw the vehicle. But when they heard the voice... They knew it was me. Then I got the text. Uh, that ain't nice. <laughs> you know? So then they knew there was a pastor in front of them. But oftentimes the voice will go forth that way too. Sometimes it comes through hard and stern, sometimes soft and sweet. But again, your voice is carrying your spirit. The book of Hebrews tells us this principle that even though we see a thing or hear a thing, it had its origin from the spirit. Hebrews 11.3 says, by faith we understand that. The universe was formed at God's command and that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. In other words, when God created something, he didn't start with something. The greatest thing God ever used was nothing. You ever thought of that? You know, there was nothing. It was void. Nothing out there and God spoke and it was. 
That's some power. Now, we're, we're unable to do that. We've got to, we got to, when we see something, we can create something out of that. And we can believe God for things and pull it in. But as a rule, we understand that, that everything starts out in the spirit world. Again, even from our thinking, everything that was, you know, from a Harley to, to, to a saddle on a horse, somebody had to think that thing through, and then they start developing and putting it out. So the response to spiritual influence creates atmosphere. Spirits can't make you do anything. The devil didn't make you do it. He gave you an inclination or a thought to do it. They can only influence you partly. Now, this is accomplished is through atmosphere, which is created through responding to spiritual influence, whether life or death. When you respond to anger, it creates an atmosphere of anger. You respond to poverty, it's going to do the same thing. When you respond to depression, you're going to stay depressed because you responded to that spiritual atmosphere. When you respond to joy, joy starts coming. Next thing you know, you hear me, you can't even say the word without smiling. Try it. Try it again. See what it did to you? It messed you up, won't it? Even God can throw words at you, man. It helps you work it out. When you respond to love, it creates an atmosphere of love, forgiveness, kindness, and gentleness. We have to understand the difference between response and initiation. God's an initiator. God's always going to push you. God's always going to talk to you. God ain't never going to back off. I told you Sunday, as he wrestled Jacob, he'll wrestle you. He will initiate things on you. He'll begin to work to change your life. Amen. That's just what God does. So God said, let everything that hath breath... God spoke to us, let everything have breath. Praise the Lord. He initiated it. How do we respond? Hallelujah. Amen. We respond with a praise. So God initiates, we respond. He said, let everything that hath. <gasps> praise the Lord. Let everything that hath. <gasps> Everybody try it? <gasps> okay, then you qualify. <laughs> Amen. You don't have to fill out any kind of resume or nothing like that. Doesn't even have to be a pretty voice. All you got to have is <gasps> try it again. You got it, man. So you're all there. We're all there together. So defining moments and seasons, Matthew 16, 1, Jesus spoke a very harsh word to the Pharisees when he said to them, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning today, it will be stormy. And by the way, look at it again. When evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. We know this. I, it was Brother Jimmy that taught me. Red at night, sailor's delight. Red in the morning, sailor's warning. So when I see a red sky at night, particularly when I'm on my motorcycle somewhere, I start smiling. Because that means at least when I start off, it's going to be dry. <laughs> you know. So I, I just picked that up. When I, and I remember people saying that when I was young. I never caught it. And Brother Jimmy would say it to me because he was a sailor. He understood how important. And Jesus said, you've understood this part. You figured that out. He replied, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the evening and in the morning today, it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. You're missing out on this. Matter of fact, he goes on to say, tell them that it will be like in the times of Jonah. That people will be, uh, uh, be an adulterous generation. People will be married and giving in marriage. They'll, they'll be partying. They won't have a, a desire toward God. There's going to be a, a, an influence away from it. He said, you, you guys don't even understand the signs and the times. In other words, defining moments. So discerning the times and seasons in life, understanding that God's time may not be ours, but God will always get his way. Frustration is the result of being uncoordinated with the season that God has you in. Everybody here is in a certain season and time in your life. But if you get out of step with it, all you're going to be is frustrated. You're going to be mad at God, upset with God. But when you get in the right place, I was walking behind Mr. Gant the other day. And Mr. Gant, you know, is in, in, going through rehab. And Miss Dolly was up front. And uh, th there was a lady behind him holding him up as he's getting his strength back in his legs. And, and I had his wheelchair. And we started walking. And I, and I started saying it to him as we were heading up the hill. Left, left. Left, right, left. And I, I'm, I'm barking out a cadence down the hall of the hospital behind him. And, and, he's, and I can tell he's hearing it. And he starts doing it. Left, 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 right, left. And, it's just start, and once you start getting in a cadence, then you're not stumbling. You're not falling around. And if you've got somebody walking with you that's marching with you, and if you say, that's why they say it. So everybody can hear it. Left. And in, in the church, you know, we should be hearing in the spirit. Left. Left, left, right, left. You know, when we get ready to do something for ALS, we all jumped in. When it was Alzheimer's, we all jumped in. When it's Muscle Car Sunday, we all jumping in. When worship starts, left, 
Left, left, right, left. Everybody's involved in worship. When the word's out, the Bible's open and notepad's open. Left, 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 right, left. But if you come in here and your mind's on something else, you're doing something else. You got left, right, left, right, left, right. You look like some type of, type of a rapper or something with his pants hanging down around his knees. He can't walk. You know, that ain't what God wants in his house. Can I get an amen? Amen. Man, he wants us in cadence. He wants us working together and understanding the season. Jesus said, you understand the natural, but you can't discern the spiritual. Many times, when, even in the Old Testament, when you walk into the Old Testament, the Lord would reveal the spiritual through the natural. This is important because this carried on not only into the New Testament days, but also into our days. You'll hear people talking like this. When a natural drought was a sign of spiritual dry season. Even among Native Americans, when the, when, when the ground got too dry, dry, what did they start doing? They got spiritual. They started dancing. They started trying to call forth the rain. And what often they felt like, and even among some more heathenistic nations that, that had seen, you know, just because you're heathen don't mean you ain't spiritual. Hello. I read, my, whole, my whole plan was heathen. But every now and then we had spiritual moments. Huh? We understood there's spirit involved in his life. You know, there's something going on out here that's bigger than we are. And even, even among the heathen, when it got dry, man, they would, they would start dancing. They would start uh, sacrificing. Do you remember even in the Old Testament when Elijah came along in the Mount Carmel? There had been no rain in three years. And they talked about calling the fire down from heaven. The issue was rain. They would cut themselves. And oftentimes sacrifices were given. Didn't y'all see King Kong? Okay. That's a true story. Uh, rain was often co-related to times of refreshing. So when the rain came, it was like, yes, we're finally right with God. Everything's good again. We're going to have harvest. We're going to have blessings. Good things are going to come on our life. You know, and so they, that, that was a correlate. That was understanding times and seasons. Wilderness related to hard barren times. If you had to go out in the, in the, into the wilderness when Abraham sent, uh, 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 what was uh, Hagar and Ishmael? When he sent them out, the Bible says they went out into the wilderness. Whenever you read scripture about people, when Jesus was tempted, was he in town? He was in the wilderness. So the wilderness, anytime you saw wilderness, it spoke of hard, barren times. Oasis, Elam was the word in the Old Testament, uh, was significant of rest, haven, uh, of peace. Whenever you got an oasis. So whenever you saw a desert and you saw an oasis in the desert, and you'll hear churches talk about we're an oasis. In the, well, shoot fire. Lakewood back in the day was known as an oasis in the desert. It would, they used an oasis of love, I think is what it was. I remember stealing bumper stickers. It's just fun to do. Put mine over it. It just is back in the day. Amen. But, but anyway, the, the, the whole thing there was oasis. When you got an oasis, you got so you discern those type of times. Noah discerned the seasons. Everyone else said, let's eat, drink, and be merry. Now, Noah, he built an ark. He stayed after it. How long? hundred years. It was a long season, I would say. And you have to discern so you can then change the climate that you live in. It's not time to get a house in the mountains and go hide. It's bad right now. But it ain't time for us to run. It ain't time for us to say, oh, my goodness, they say, they say, they say you know, 1,500 here, 15,000 there, however many. It, 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 that, that's not the point. We're not running from nothing. It ain't time to go and get a, get, get, just go lock ourselves down and say, we, we're not going to do anything. We're going to wait on Jesus to show up. We may, he may be here a day, may be here a thousand years. We don't know. He threw that at us. But I'm going to tell you, there are signs in the area. There are signs of the times that are coming forth now. And we do need to pay attention to them. And it, our belief should affect our behavior. Amen. We should start believing and moving closer and closer to him more and more and more. So it may not feel like time to you, but to me. And then there's so many things going on running through my mind. But, but I wrote this down today. Uh, I discern it's time for the harvest. I believe it's time to expand. And I say that because we still got empty seats. And no matter how full we get in here, I'll keep backing up until I'm preaching out of the baptistry. Hello. Amen. I, and that'd be fine with me. We'll, we'll, we'll just keep on going after here and out there, whatever God has for us. We'll keep, I believe it's time to expand. It's time to get, reach people. And we're not here to negotiate for souls or, or to beg for what is already ours. You know, I, I, don't, I don't go and say, uh, devil, please give me my kids back. They're my kids. 
Amen. I don't say give my friends back. They're my friends. Amen. I pray them back in. I believe God for them. I go after them. I'll snatch them back if I have to. And we build the kingdom of God. We preach without apology. We walk with authority. If it's sin, it's sin. If it's right, it's right. If it's wrong, it's wrong. You never go wrong doing right. Amen. Or admitting your own faults and moving through life. So there are defining moments. Here, tonight, you're walking into a defining moment of fellowship. A lot of people back away from this, but understand, Hebrews 10, 25 says, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. Even during the time of the writing of the book of Hebrews, and we believe it was Paul that wrote it, he said there were people that gathered and gathered and gathered, and then they got where life was taken over, and things were going on in their life, and they quit getting together. I love getting together. I love coming here and seeing your face. When there's certain faces that are always here on Tuesday night, that's a good thing. Then there are new faces added. Then on Sunday, we see new faces coming in. I, I, I don't know, guys. You've got to start. Uh, I hope you stay here longer than I do on Sunday and fellowship with people and just kind of hang out because there's some good people coming up in this house. Amen. And they're looking for fellowship, and they're looking for friends, and they're looking for connection, and they're, they're looking to know when sis is getting together to sweat some, and, and they, they're looking for somebody to take out to eat, and they're looking for somebody to help pray for them and help them through the next. You've been through stuff in your life. Maybe you can help them go through times in their life. So don't give up. So as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see what? The day approaching. What day is that? The day that Jesus is coming back again. Keep encouraging each other. There's something about the power of friends and connections. I can't say enough about it. There's something about it. You know, Pastor Kenneth called me today and I talked with him. He, he's a funny guy. And if you don't know, Kenneth retired Sunday. He's no longer the pastor of his church. He told me, he said, I, I can't do this uh, uh, anymore. He said, but I'm going to travel and preach. And I said, well, I'm, I still call you preacher then. You can come preach for us. Still love you. But he's just a funny guy. There's they, not going to be another Kenneth in my life. That's why I hang on to him. He's just funny. I mean, he tells me, you're the only, you're the only preacher that's not turned his back on me. Not that good. You, you, well, that, that's neither here nor there. The bottom line is this. You're my friend. Amen. You've always been my friend. Because he thinks like me. He, he does that. He told me, he said, guys, on a, on a, this happened to my dad back in the day. But he said, I was on a tractor uh, uh, tilling up my peas. And yellow, yellow jacks come out of the hole. He said, I ain't got hair like you. He said, and then yellow jacks popped the top of my head. I had pop knots all over the top of my head. <laughs> and, then he, and then the story goes like this. And the next day, I walked out. I saw a yellow jacket, and I got down on my hands and my knees, and I followed till I saw two of them, and then I saw three, and then I saw what them son of a guns were coming out of a hole in the ground, and I said, you pour a bottle of gas in it? He said, no, I poured a gallon. <laughs> I asked him, I said, you light it? He said, uh-uh, man, it'll blow the hole out in the middle of my field. It was like Caddyshack, you know, I mean, you know. We're blowing stuff up. So, but, so I love him. He's, he's my friend. You know, I'm not going to not answer the phone when he calls me. Uh, the older we get, the more you're going to need for me. Verse 38 says, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I'll not be pleased with him. You being here tonight pleases God. You didn't shrink back. You live by faith. What's that mean? Sometimes you don't feel it. Sometimes you don't feel in, that God loves you. Sometimes you don't feel all excited about the things of God. But to, to understand this, I'm going to live by faith, and I ain't shrinking back. The worst thing a, a believer can have is the shrinks. <laughs> Write that down. That's a first here tonight. <laughs> Amen. Excuse me, bro. You ought to walk up to somebody who ain't been in church once. Excuse me. Let, me, let me. let me diagnose you just real quick here. Yeah? Yeah? You got the shrinks. <laughs> I got the what? You got the shrinks. You ain't been in church in a few weeks. You shrinking. Amen. What's shrinking? Watch this. Help me. Help me. Little spiritual man inside of you. Little bitty arms. Help me. I'm dying. Come back to church. Hey, hey, hey. hey. And then the voice gets bigger. Hey, hey. Hey, 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 you sound like Fat Albert coming in. Hey, 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 man. Yeah, yeah, all of a sudden, it's back and it's big, man. It's, everything's good. Stay away from church. Little why? help me. I dare you walk up to somebody, put them on there. Say, you, I think you got your shrinks. You know, where do you get that from? Out of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 38. And God ain't real happy with you right now. But you coming here tonight is a defining moment. It's a good thing to be here. Amen. So there is a moment when something comes to you that represents everything you believe at one moment. 
time, place, people, for every shift in the Spirit, it comes through something that may seem incidental, but it represents everything you believe. I, I, I can't put my finger on the time and the date, but I do remember when, when two words came across my mind. It actually, that I saw the book, and when I saw a book that somebody wrote, I, I don't let the cat out of the bag much, but when I saw the book, it, it hit me, this is who we were, and the book was called Holy Wild. And, and it just it just well all over me. And it was like, you know, maybe this guy thought he had a book. For me, it was my lifestyle. Everything I had been doing up to that point, it was at that moment, it was a defining moment in my life that this is who I am. And this is what I am to teach. And this is who I am to be. I, I have never read the book. I've never read the book, Dick. I've read bits and pieces, but I've never read page to page of the book. I didn't need to. All I needed to see was those two words. And I didn't care where they come from. And I'm not concerned about plagiarizing. I don't even know how to spell that word. <laughs> I really don't even know what it means, but I think it, okay, I know a little. <laughs> but moments in time that define people in places that we would have never known if it not for that defining moment. When you got born again, it was a defining moment. When you gave your life to Christ, it was a defining moment. When God delivered you from things, it was a defining moment. It, things began to change in your life. Uh, when, when Moses' defining moment, Moses' first a response to spiritual influence, his presence is that which frees one from bondage, liberates their family to its greatest possibilities, and opens the way to the future without the entanglements of the past. Moses walked into something at one time, and look at that, that, that paragraph again. His presence, God's presence in your life is that which frees you from bondage. It's like as soon as you walk in and you sense his presence and you respond to his presence, it liberates you and your family to its greatest possibilities and opens the way to the future without the entanglements of the past. What God was fixing to do in the life of Moses was epic. It was a defining moment. He was going to use one man and one man to set over 2 million people free. He was going to use one man, speak through that man, work miracles through that man, a man who had a stuttering problem, a man who had issues in his own life, a man who had murdered another man, a man who was working for his father-in-law for 40 years. How big a failure do you think Moses was? He was still working for his father-in-law for 40 years. That's rough stuff right there, man. Taking, and now he's got a word from God. He's responding to something. Here's the scripture, uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, who? His father-in-law. The priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert. And it came to Horeb, the mountain of who? That's important. I'm going to, I'm going to teach you something tonight you've never heard before. Well, maybe you have, but I'm not smart enough that I just figured it out. The mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on, was on fire, it did not burn up. He saw. He observed it. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight when the bush does not burn up. Now I told you last, uh, uh, last Tuesday, it was not uncommon for a bush to catch on fire in that desert near Mount Horeb. It, it was actually a common occurrence. The issue was it didn't burn up. And when you're watching something and it ain't burning up, now, now there's something going on here. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, you got, you got to get Charlton Hester. Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I have heard them crying out because of the slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israel has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. Go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. This was a watershed moment in history. Something shifted. Something happens. From that moment on, things will never be the same. Once he responded, and I'm not saying that you're going to have this on your way home or while you're eating a blizzard at Dairy Queen or whatever you do, but eventually all of us need defining moments. All of us need a moment in life 
where our life shifts, where our life changes, where something good. And maybe, perhaps, God's looking for you to talk to you about your family, your situation, or maybe this whole community. You've got that much pull where God can say something to you, and you start moving in a certain way, and next thing you know, you're hearing the voice of God. God starts standing behind you, standing you up, and things start changing here, and it starts the literally an epicenter where it starts moving throughout the world. And you say to yourself, well, it can't happen here. I disagree with you. I believe somehow, some way, when God touches somebody's life and they have a defining moment with God and they respond to spiritual influence, things start to change. God ain't going to come to you unless he wants something to change. If he wants not to better your life. Was this not something to better uh, the life of Moses? Absolutely. What was he doing? Tending sheep for his father-in-law for 40 years. He would have died in the desert. And everybody would have put on his appetite. Goat. Shepherd. Died. I don't know. What would I, what they put on Moses? But instead... They put on Moses, the man that brought forth the ten plagues, the man that brought the crossing of the Red Sea, the man who who stayed the course and helped disciple and pastor over two million people for 40 years, the man that brought them to the edge of the promised land. His legacy is deep. The giver of the law, the one that came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, this was him. No longer the man that hung out in the desert. Some of you think, well, my life's just mundane. Listen, just start responding the spiritual influence and see what God does. God heard their cry and remembered the covenant of the promised land. Listen, when you study the history, the first hundred years, they didn't cry out. They were there 400 years. The first hundred years, they did not cry out. They went along to get along. That's us. We're just going along to get along. Uh, Being multiplied as a people, they become a threat. The pharaohs made them mix mud and mortar without sand. They, they start multiplying even more. You know, that sounds like what happened many times in our nation. If you look back at our nation, just real quick, in 1776, men stood together and prayed to the God of heaven that he would bless this land, that there would be freedom from tyranny for the religion that we wanted to preach and teach. Then if you move forward 100 years from 1776, Abraham Lincoln declared in the Emancipation Proclamation at Gettysburg an address for God to liberate all people. And I ain't here to ask you whether you're for or against him. I just want you to hear this. When in his inaugural address in 1865, he spoke 702 words out of those 16 appeals to God and four references to Scripture. Today, we can't get a man to quote uh, one verse out of the Bible. They're scared of the Bible. They're afraid somehow they're going to get a lawsuit against them, but he jumps into there. And you jump another 100 years to 1965, we got an atheist woman saying, I don't want kids to pray in school and remove... Uh, and we removed the students' prayer from our public schools. That was a defining moment in our nation. No more prayer in school. Jump ahead another 10 years. We got another one. Abortion on demand, Roe versus Wade. Another defining moment in our nation. Where at any time, any place, anywhere, at any, uh, at any degree of the baby, you could have an abortion. Another 10 years later, we removed the Ten Commandments from our government buildings. I'm going to tell you something. Evil's having defining moments. It's time for righteousness to have some defining moments. Amen. To, to get a, you know, I don't know how long it's going to take before we get tired of the pharaohs of this day and this time pushing us around before we ask God to send us a deliverer or ask God, is it me that you want us to do it? There has got to come a time that we quit getting along to go along. That we not get afraid, that we stand up to fight, that we speak our mind. You know, we, we're so nervous about being politically correct. I don't even know what politically correct means. That was close. There comes a point that you've backed up as far as you're going to back up. This moment represents everything I believe I am. I'm not willing to give up any more ground. Uh, We're going to have to fight the final or last straw. It's not about what you took. It's not not, not, not that you took my lunch money. It meant more than that. Not that you took my lunch. It's more than that. It's what it represents. My family, my freedom, who I am. And it's speaking like this on a midweek service. You know, this needs something to be bellowed out from the anthem halls but somehow some way we got to let folk know I, I don't know all the answers this is it Moses didn't know all the answers Moses didn't know there were going to be 10 plagues ahead. Moses didn't know all, all the trouble he was going to go through Moses didn't know how, how, how much God was going to have to have his back all he knew was respond and then in other words let me say it like this quit doing all the talking you do the walking God will do the talking 
Amen. You walk, God will talk. He'll set you up, man. He'll make this thing happen. And so, so I look back at it. And I say, God, you've you got to do this thing. Well, when I look at watershed moments in history where something shifted, something happened, they, 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 Woodstock was a moment. It was a defining moment. You can never take them old hippies back to Woodstock and make it happen again. It ain't going to happen again. It was a one-time thing. It never happened. But it changed our culture. Our music shifted in this nation. And, and it, there was a fight against it, but it changed. Uh, uh, you know, when I, you th- segregation. Roe versus, uh, not, not, I mean, Brown versus the Board of Education. Where, where we decided, you know, enough of saying uh, this school is going to be white and this is going to be uh, black and this is going to be brown. Everybody together. That was a defining moment for our nation. We had to learn how to get along. We had to start, stop looking at each other's color and start realizing that if, if you love God or if we had something in common, we, we'd get along with one another. Amen. Amen? When a woman named Rosa Park refused to sit on the back of a bus and sit up front. Now, the, 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 listen, the problem in our nation is not one of racism. It's a human problem. It's not so much racism. It's a human problem. We have problems inside of us. When I look at abortion, it's not so much about convenience or, 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 or uh, it, it's a human problem. It's a human problem that we've got. We got to deal with these things as we keep moving forward. You know, I, I, when Rosa decided I ain't sitting down, things changed. Things changed. And there comes a time in our life where we say, you know what, I ain't sitting on the back of this bus again. I'm sitting anywhere I want. If it has an open seat, I'm taking it. Amen. And, and, and to make that kind of move. So again, racism is not a, it's not a white and black problem. It's a human problem. Slavery was not a white and black problem. It's a human problem. It's problems that we got. We need a defining moment. The Boston Tea Party. We, that, that, this is trying to start up again. The Tea Party, uh, they, they, as a matter of fact, they call them the Tea Party. But the Boston Tea Party, it wasn't about tea. It was about taxation without representation. you taxing us, but you ain't representing us. Amen. So now, somehow, and even in our political realms, many of you are agitated. You're frustrated. But here's the thing. I'm not responding to Facebook. I'm not responding to the TV. I'm not res- I want to respond to God. And if God says do something, then I move in this direction. Can I get an amen? amen? Because the devil is good at making it all seem like small issues. But in that moment, you realize it's about something bigger. It's about more than just my seat. It's more than just this thing. Prayer out of school, God out of government, attack on our children. Moses had moments in his life. And when he did, watch what he did. First, God calls us into his fiery presence. After Moses responded, he looked, then God called to him. Many of us are opposite. We sit home, we go through life with it. Well, you know, God talks to me the way pastor says, I'll respond. Because he quit sitting home waiting on him to talk to you. You start walking, I'll start talking. Amen. You start moving. Put away the notion that the presence of God can be tamed to our taste. A bush caught on fire. A voice came. I, I, and I, I see an exclamation point. I see a loud voice. But there was a time when, it, when there was big booms and bangs and there was a little quiet voice. You can't tame God. He's wild, man. There's things about God that we, you're never going to figure out. Look at his creation and realize who the creator is. Look, I, the older I get, the more I hone in on National Geographics, and I'm, I see the, the octopus and the hippopotamus and, 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 and giraffes that can reach up and pull leaves off during a drought when everything else down below is dying. It's up there eating, up there, tall and heavy. I look at God's creation, and I'm going, you, God, you are too cool. And inside our bodies, how he developed us and made us and put us together, everything about him. Look at the creation. You realize how wild our creator is. Amen. There's nothing, you can't tame him. You can't tame him to your own taste. Well, I like a little this in my religion, a little that in my religion. Every now and then God comes in and blows into the place. And you, oh, what in the world? There's a rushing mighty wind. There was a fire that came in. People were talking in other tongues. Folk, they're getting about a wheelchair. People were getting healed. Well, that ain't the way we do it down at our Presbyterian church. <laughs> God don't care. He don't care. He blows in, blows up. What you don't want is him to blow out. You want him to stay here with us, amen? So put that away. He wants our attention so we'll respond so he can talk to us. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. He was high lifted up. And his glory filled the temple. In other words, I walked into the house of God, and all I could see was God. And it just filled up the place. And then, and then during, that, watch this, during that moment, it wasn't, hey, look at me, I'm a rock star. 
When you get in the presence of God, the first thing you want to do is repent. It's to look at yourself and say, God, forgive me for being uh, uh, lazy, languid, listful. Forgive me for not being uh, uh, careful with others, for being greedy in my, in my giving and the way I've lived toward other folks. Forgive me for not caring. When, when this man, Isaiah, and it happened all through the Scripture, but when Isaiah saw him, high lifted up, the Scripture says, he said to God, Whoa, I'm a man of unclean lips. And by the way, I dwell among people with unclean lips. Everybody I'm around telling a bad joke. Everybody I'm around telling a dirty story. Everybody I'm around, they're they, they, they not lifting you up. Everybody I'm around, he said, this is how I am. And then God took a coal, sent an angel, take a coal off, the, off the, the, the altar, and he burned the lips. And then he said, the question was, who will go for me? And Isaiah said, here I am. I'll go. What are you going to do? See, our thing is we want to know the plan. We want details. Yes. Ladies, huh? Give us details. Which shoes should we wear? A dress or pants? I need to know. I just got, I got to know. Can I wear a hat? Huh? I need to know the details. Many of the men don't care much about the details, but we still want to know what to plan huh, before we go here. And, we'll, we'll go out, and God don't give it to us. He don't give it to us. Just start the little country church. The Lord ain't 30 folk. Just start the little country church. The Lord, all we got is a camp out here, and we don't own it. Just start the little country church. Well, maybe we can rent this place. Just, we ain't got no camps, we ain't got no money coming in. Just, just start the little country church. You start it, I'll send them. And I look back over 11 years now, and I marvel at what we've done with God's help without a plan. Huh? We didn't have a plan. We didn't have a thought, how are we going to do this thing? We didn't know how to run a youth camp. I knew how to, how to have camp. But didn't know how to run it. I knew how to have church, but didn't know how to run one. There's a difference. You know, there's business to all of this. So, but you just start. You just do it, and I'll take it. And it is, it get, hear me, young couples here, little by little. You'll never get what your parents took them 30 years to get overnight. It's little by little. And that little by little will mean more to you as you get older. Than anything else, you'll look back on that little by little, and you'll say, God, that was good days. Those were good times. When I didn't have a whole lot, I had to believe God for the, this little, to get to that little, amen, to get to that little, to get to that little. And, and I know some of you going, but when, but man, when, when's, when's, the, when's the rain coming? Just hang on. It's little by little. Amen. Because now you've got <sighs> memories to look back on. You, you've got things you can draw back, and you have faith that what if God can do that, if during that little time, God can take care of me today. That's why our faith gets built. So God called him. God calls us. Watch this. God calls us to remove our shoes. The issue is not being barefoot, but the removal of one's self-fashioned support. In other words, when I have my shoes on, this supports me. But no longer is it about me. This is about you. Now, I want you to show you something else. Two things real quick. He said, do not come any closer. God said, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Here's what we have thought and preached for years. That that place was holy ground. Why? Because God was there. God showed up, so it's holy ground. That's probably not true. He's at Horeb, the Mount of God. All the other sheep herders wouldn't even bring their sheep near there. Let me give it to you. Because it's a holy place. You don't, you don't run your sheep, cows, or, or horses up through a holy place. You stay away. It's Horeb, the Mount of God. But Moses is trespassing. Let me, give, let me drop it down a little bit more. Moses has got where he don't care as much as he used to. It don't matter like it used to. When you get to the place, when you start trespassing on God's stuff, you fit to get God's attention. And at that moment, now, now you see how this works? At that moment, God speaks out and says, hey, get your shoes off. You're on holy ground. You're at the Mount of Horeb. You're on holy ground. So get them, get them kick them off right now. Now he's got Moses' attention. I don't know if you've ever trespassed. Some of you don't have that look. There's another word for it. Posted, keep out. 
There ain't nothing funner than to cross a fence that says no trespassing and take a watermelon you didn't grow. I apologize, but it's a part of my past. As a matter of fact, it happened several times, and I know the farmers normally let us have it because they knew who we were. But we'd sneak over and thump a melon and get back across that fence. That post would keep it. Sometimes it, that trespass had meant there was a big white Brahma bull. It was in Charlie Johnson's field in which we cut across. The issue is you had to decide, is the bull far enough from the fence that when I cross this trespassing moment to get to the other side of that field, can I make it in time? And after you've done this four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, ten times, you started getting it down. But there ain't nothing like sliding your butt up under a fence, a barbed wire fence with a Brahma bull chasing you. <laughs> there ain't nothing like it. I heard a story once about a guy who was trying to outrun a Brahma bull, and the bull got after him. And, and man, he ran his all his might tired, and he saw a limb, and it looked real high, and he jumped. And when the bull went right after him, he missed the limb, but he caught it coming down. It'll, it'll motivate you, amen? It'll push you where you hadn't been. So at this moment, we, we realize that, that God speaks to him. Get, get your shoes off. Watch Middle Eastern custom when they go to pray. What do they do? They take their shoes off. Still to this day, the removal of the shoes. Holy ground. God's here. It's an indication. Now, we don't come in here and we don't take our shoes off. But our worship is an indication that we're not leaning on any type of self-support. When I worship God, I'm telling God my shoes are off, my hands are lifted, my heart is open. Amen. Amen. I, I'm looking for a defining moment. I need a moment in my and I don't know when it will come, so i got to stay, stay ready. Then God calls us to know his heart. It was in God's presence that Moses learned God's gentle heart and his desire to heal and deliver. He said, I have indeed seen the misery. I have heard them crying. And I am concerned about their suffering. Let me, let me say something to you. God has seen you crying in the nighttime. God is concerned about your suffering. He hears you. If God hears his people 5,000 years ago, he hears you now. He still hears us. Amen. So I have come down to rescue them, to bring them up and out. I want to tell you, there's coming a day that he's going to come down to rescue us. And he's going to bring us up and out. Amen. It's going to happen. So when you study this, and you can go to Isaiah chapter, uh, it's in Isaiah 40s. You're going to see that, that God has ears that hear. He has ears that hear us. Matter of fact, he has eyes that see us. They run to and fro, seeking whom he may bless. He has a heart. He loves us. He takes the ewe lambs and holds them in his, in, his, uh, in his breast here. He holds us. He has a heart. So he loves us with a heart and he holds us with his arms. God is compassionate toward us. Look, a defining moment can't be achieved unless I know God is for me. I got to know God is for me. So at that moment, he understands it. And then he calls us to leave. Then he just says simply to him, now go. What's the plan? Go. What's the plan, please? Go. Just go. See, sometimes like you come to church on Tuesday night, God just said, go. Oh, what's he preaching? You notice I never put that on the sign out front? What's, what's it going to be like tonight? Don't know. We'll get here and find out together. Amen. Amen. We have a defining moment of fellowship together. Amen. And then we believe in God. For Many of our families need defining moments. Our fa Man, when I, when I got that call today about that sweet mom and what happened, and that's the second one in 10 days. I say, God, we need defining moments. See, that is a defining moment in someone's life. But some good moments. Some things that turn some things around. Amen? Amen? Make no mistake. First, we have to respond. And the fact is people will be affected by whether or not we accept our call to God's purpose in our lives. Ask yourself. You got, you got to do this because I do it to me all the time. What if I decided I ain't doing this no more? What if I decided that 11 years ago? I ain't doing it. Does that not mean we wouldn't be meeting here? That you would not be meeting here? No. It doesn't mean that. It means God would have probably raised up somebody else. Amen. Don't ever look at yourself and act like you all that. 
The thing is, though, is realize that when you respond to spiritual influence, when you gave your life to Christ, when you started turning things around in your life, when you started believing God for the best, when you did the best you could with your children, and you started pouring your life into them, all of these defining moments, man, they, they build up. Some of them are so, they, they look like fine moments. They're small moments to you. But in, in the scale of eternity, you have no idea how far it's going to reach. How many people it's going to affect. So you stay with life, man. You keep pressing through life. You keep uh, responding to spiritual influence. Because when you do that, an atmosphere begins to begin sustain. It creates a climate. A climate maintained creates strongholds. And, and I think the last point got cut off. But strongholds uh, maintain, create culture. Amen. And we're able to have a culture. Stand with me. Can we go deep enough tonight? Amen. 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 Everybody learn? Catch it? All right? Amen. Amen. To those watching us by HolyWild.tv, we thank you for checking us out. And I pray you're learning something and that you find a church, a home church, start going to it. And you'll realize that uh, you create atmosphere when you walk into a place just like these people have. Let me talk to you guys real quick. How many feel like you're due for a defining moment? Yeah, that's what I thought. You're due for one. A defining yeah. Now, so what we've done is, is we prepared ourselves. We, we sowed toward it, sowed toward it, sowed toward it with our life, and now we're waiting to reap it. So what we've got to be ready for is be sensitive. Sensitive to what God says to us. To hear Him. And quit, quit thinking with old church ears like, oh, I've heard that before, I've heard that before. But God, I love the new. I love the new. I love the refreshings. I love those times. But God, I'll live by faith, whether I get them or not. But I thank you, God, that when you initiated 11 years in our lives, we responded to you. And for everything that's happened since then, that's brought us to this time, God, give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to the church. Let us be quick to respond to the spiritual influences in our life. And God, I pray for defining moments to start happening in the lives of your believers. My prayer, God, is there be something epic that would take place, that would change lives, begin to affect this city, this county, this state, this nation. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on, bless the Lord tonight. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Uh, before you walk out of here, I'll just let you know that Sunday, barring something crazy, I will probably be on some type of a walker. I'll have surgery on Thursday. And I, the only reason I'm letting you know is so that you don't get that shock moment when you see me. Uh, we're going to get my foot under control. It will not correct the problem in the foot. It will just correct the infection that keeps chronically popping up. So uh, bear with me. Uh, some of you, I'm going to need to use you to go to hospitals to help uh, reach out to others when I'm unable to go. And uh, supposed to be this way for three weeks. Nick, you, I know you're my Baytown man. That's right. That's right. I'm glad of that. And so... Uh, Pray for one another, lift one another up. I ain't going through nothing. This ain't no big thing. Let me just say that to you. This is not a big thing I'm going through. It's just something I got to go through. So a little time I'll get through. Shane, good to see you here tonight. I love you. God loves you. All of a sudden, I see shrink leaving you right now. No more shrinks, baby. No more shrinks. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, do me a favor. Go get your children. <laughs>